Church, the Lord has given me a message to share with you today, entitled, Let Us Walk by Faith. That's what Jeremy Camp sang about. We need to walk by faith. And friends, we don't need faith. I want you to listen to this. We don't need faith to get us through the best of times. But rather, we need faith to get us through the worst of times. Although we need faith in every area of our lives, we're going to focus today on faith getting us through the adversities of life. Now listen, I don't want to share bad news with you. I said that before. But there will be adversities in your life. I will never stand here and tell you that you get saved and everything is wonderful and peachy. You're still going to come under attack. You're still going to experience the onslaught of the enemy. This is how it is. But the good news is that no weapon formed against you is permitted to prosper. So even though the enemy forms weapons against us, and he does it all the time, he prevents that weapon from prospering. We may have some thing, sickness, come against our body, but the ultimate prosperity of that would be death. God will keep us from death because he's promised us a long life. Now, that's not to say that our body is going to live forever, but our body is not going to give up one minute before its predestined expiration date. When God created us, the word speaks of there being an appointed time. You know what that means? That for everything in life, an appointment has already been made. And the coming of Jesus, the return of Jesus for his bride, has an appointed time. Church, we need to learn to walk by faith, because that's what's going to keep us prepared for that moment when that trumpet sounds. Now, the faith that we're going to be looking at today is more than the I think so kind of faith. But rather, it's the I know so and nothing can change my mind kind of believing. Amen? The Greek word that was used by the Apostle Paul in his teachings on faith was the word pistis, P-I-S-T-I-S. And it means fully persuaded. That means that there's not anything in you that isn't convinced that what God said is true. It furthermore means moral conviction of a religious truth. You're convinced that something that God said is true and nothing can change your mind. It also means, listen, full reliance upon Christ for salvation. Church, every one of us needs salvation. Those people that were left behind in that sanctuary, these were church-going people still left behind because their heart wasn't really right with the Lord. Listen, there's plenty of people that got saved only because somebody forced them up in an altar call to go pray a prayer. They had no desire to go. They didn't mean a word that they said. They went through the motions. That doesn't save your soul. Church, this salvation that every one of us has need of which comes by faith. This salvation means our rescue. It means our healing, our deliverance. It means victory and prosperity. It means the full assurance that heaven will be our home. Don't you want that? I certainly do. And, and if, if we really believe that Jesus came to save us, then we have that assurance. We can rest assured that heaven is our home, that, that we'll be victorious in the battles of life. Church, in the 
New Testament, beside Jesus himself, it was the Apostle Paul that faced probably the worst of times. I mean, indescribable hardship and adversity. But he made it. Friends, that's what matters. He made it. Listen to this. If you have your Bible with you, I'm going to ask you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I'm going to begin to read in verse 24. Today I'm reading at least this part from the NIV. 2 Corinthians 11 verse 24. Paul says, Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. 39 lashes across his back. Do you know that that's what Jesus received? 40 minus one. Paul didn't have this happen to him once. It didn't happen to him twice, three times, four times, five times. During his ministry, he was tied to a tree or a pole and he was whipped by the Jews. 39 stripes across his back. Can you imagine what his back had to look like? In verse 25, he says, three times I was beaten with rods. Three times. He says, once I was pelted with stones. Listen, it's no fun having them try to stone you to death. He says, three times I was shipwrecked. That one always gets me. Especially having been a boater. I always like to be able to see the land. Even though I had every kind of navigation gadget known, I still wanted to be able to see the land. Here Paul is out in the middle of the oceans out there. Three times he was shipwrecked. Do you think the devil was trying to turn him off course a little bit? Listen to this. I spend a night and a day in the open sea. <laughs> How would you like to do that? How would you like to have a shipwreck? You bob it around like a cork, probably hold it onto a piece of wood, and the whole night goes by, nothing. He's looking, 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 not a ship on the horizon. The whole next day, the whole next night, nothing. There's sharks in that water. In verse 26, he says, I've been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I've been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face the, uh, daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. In verse 32, he says, in Damascus, the, the governor under King Aretas had the city of Damascenes guarded in order to arrest me. But I was lowered in a basket from a window in the wall and slipped through his hands. Church, do you think, you think he had a, I mean, come on, think about this. And we think we have it tough sometimes? I mean, we sometimes feel persecuted. We sometimes feel that we're fighting a losing battle. We sometimes feel rejected, unloved. <laughs> I mean, we sometimes feel abandoned by God. We may feel that he's forsaken us, but not Paul. In spite of all these adversities, listen to this quote of his in the same letter, the second letter he wrote to the Corinthian church in, in Chapter 5 and verse 7 in the King James, it says, For we walk by faith, not by sight. 
What he was saying is, no matter what you've experienced, no matter what you've been through, no matter how you feel on the inside or the outside, you've got to believe God. You've got to trust God. You know, sometimes we're very affected by what we've just gone through. Thinking that God just, he blew it. God should have been there and he wasn't. You have no idea what might have happened. You have no idea. Maybe, maybe God let you go through something to, to spare that thing from killing you in the end. Oh, praise God. Yeah, go ahead. Listen, Paul may not have seen the hand of God when he was being whipped by the Jews, but he knew that God would bring him through. Paul may not have seen the presence of the Lord when beaten with those rods, when, when stoned, when shipwrecked, when floating at sea for a night and a day. I still can't imagine that. When trying to escape bandits, when hungry and thirsty, when cold and naked. He may not have seen, but yet he still believed. And he made it through to serve another day. Friends, life is not always good to us, but God is always good. Do you hear what I just said? God never promised us a perfect life, but he promised us a perfect end. For every one of us, there's a good expected end, the word says. Friends, I'll say it again. We don't need faith to get us through the best of times. Rather, we need faith to get us through the worst of times. Amen? I want to share with you another great example of faith in God. And this we recently discussed not too long ago in our Bible study. It comes out of 1 Samuel. Chapter 14, verses 6 through 15. And this is an account of a real move of God in the life of Jonathan, son of King Saul. And this was a move of God that was produced entirely by Jonathan's faith. Beginning in verse 6 of 1 Samuel 14, in the NIV, it says, Jonathan said to his young armor bearer, Come. Let us go over to the outpost of those uncircumcised men. He was speaking about the Philistine army. These were the most ferocious warriors in the world at the time. He says, come on, let's go over there to those uncircumcised Philistines. He says, listen, perhaps the Lord will act in our behalf. Listen to this statement of faith now. He says, nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. It doesn't matter how big the adversity is, God can save you. That means rescue you. Amen? Save you, give you the victory. No matter how big the army is, no matter what resource the Lord is working with. Maybe he's working with, with a huge resource and maybe he's not. But the Lord says it doesn't matter. Forget about how big the adversity is. Jonathan said to his armor bearer, come on, let's go over to the outpost of those uncircumcised men. He said, nothing can hinder the Lord from saving us. Church, now those are words of faith. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving us. Verse seven. He says, do all that you have in mind. This is what his armor bearer said. The armor bearer was a kid. Jonathan was a warrior. Jonathan tells him, come on with me. We're going to go over there to the outpost of the Philistines. Two of them against the whole army. The kid tells him, I'm with you, heart and soul. Whatever you say goes. Now this kid was either full of faith or out of his mind. Verse 8, Jonathan said, come on then, we'll cross over toward them and let them see us. (laughs) 
If they say to us, wait there until we come to you, we'll stay where we are and not go up to them. But in, in verse 10, if they say, come up to us, we will climb up because that will be our sign that the Lord has given them into our hands. This is believing for an absolute miracle. There's one warrior and a, and a young kid that's his armor bearer. You know what an armor bearer is? Someone that carries his, his sword, his spear, his shield, his, his, his body armor until he needs it to go into battle. The armor bearer is not a warrior, he's a servant. So really you had one warrior and his servant that are gonna take on the whole Philistine army. And he said, if they tell us, come on up here, we're going to know that's a sign from God that the Lord has given them into our hands. How many times do you face adversities that seem so big, that seem so impossible, so unlikely? How can I ever get the victory well, this is showing you exactly how. Your faith has to be greater than the threat of that enemy. You've got to believe outside the box. Remember that with God, nothing is impossible. It might be impossible for you by yourself, but if you have faith that God is with you, you're not alone. He's with you. Verse 11, so both of them showed themselves to the Philistine outpost. Look, said the Philistines, the Hebrews are crawling out of the holes they were hiding in. The men of the outpost shouted to Jonathan and his armor bearer, come up to us and we'll teach you a lesson. Aha, uh -huh. Jonathan said, if they tell us, come up, we're going to know that the Lord's given him into our hands. So Jonathan said to his armor bearer, climb up after me. The Lord has given them into the hand of Israel. Jonathan, church, has, has now chosen to act upon his faith. You see, faith without works, meaning faith without corresponding action, is dead faith. Jonathan had the real thing here. He was going to allow his faith in God to cause him to act with the expectancy that God was going to perform what he said in his word. Verse 13, Jonathan climbed up using his hands and his feet with his armor bearer right behind him. The Philistines, listen, fell before Jonathan and his armor bearer followed and killed behind him. Verse 14, in that first attack, Jonathan and his armor bearer killed some 20 men in an area about a half an acre. Jonathan and the armor bearer climbed up there. The Philistines attacked and they killed 20 of them within like a minute. Now, I want you to see what happens here. You see, that would be a wonderful victory in the natural. But what's about to happen is very supernatural. Verse 15, then panic struck the whole army, the whole army of the Philistines, those in the camp and the field, and those in the outposts and raiding parties, and the ground shook. It was a panic sent by God. Are you hearing this? Friends, our faith moves the hand of God. And it moves his hand to do the otherwise impossible, often through things that you can only describe as improbable or highly unlikely. Now this brings to mind, to my mind at least, Moses and the three million Jews that were delivered from Pharaoh. Church, they were in Egyptian bondage for 430 years. That's twice as long as America exists. 
And they were led out of the desert by Moses, only to have Pharaoh change his mind and come in hot pursuit. I want you to join me in Exodus chapter 14. Hope you don't mind, we're going to do some reading together today. Exodus 14, beginning in verse 5. It says, when the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their mind about them and said, what have we done? We have let the Israelites go and have lost their services. They were their slaves. Verse 6, so he, meaning Pharaoh, had his chariot made ready and took his army with him. Now I want you to know, Pharaoh's army at the time was the largest, most powerful and well-equipped army on the face of the earth. Verse 7, he took 600 of the best chariots along with all the other chariots of Egypt with offices over all of them. Verse 8, it says, The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, so that he pursued the Israelites who were marching out boldly. God said, I'm going to wipe this guy out. The Egyptians, it says in verse 9, all of Pharaoh's horses and chariots, horsemen and troops, pursued the Israelites and overtook them as they camped by the sea near pi Hathiroth, opposite baal Zephron. Verse 10, as Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. you got to try to imagine this for a minute. First of all, Moses led them in what would appear to be one of the greatest military blunders of history. He brought them to a place where there was the Red Sea in front of them and a mountain to each side of them. That means there was absolutely no escape route. There was no plan B. Amen? The people look and they see Pharaoh's army marching after them. Can you imagine what thousands of chariots, for each chariot there was at least two horses, plus an army, a cavalry, plus infantry. I mean, there were thousands and thousands and thousands of men coming toward them. They could see them on the horizon getting bigger and bigger. The cloud of dust alone was enormous. They said to Moses in verse 11, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? Now those were certainly not words of faith. As far as, as, far as they were concerned, it was done, it was over. They were gonna die. Why'd you bring us here to die? Because there weren't enough graves in Egypt? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Moses answered the people in verse 13. Do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians, listen to this. This is the mindset you've got to have next time you've got an enemy coming against you and it seems like he's going to overpower you. Listen to this. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. Oh, I love it. I love it. Verse 14, the Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Listen, raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. What? Moses had to think to himself, that is the craziest thing I've ever heard. Moses had a stick. It was a walking stick, a staff. He 
is an army of thousands and thousands and thousands coming to, to absolutely destroy them. Moses, I'm sure, understand now, this was a people that were accustomed to having a pillar of fire and a cloud and all this stuff, all these supernatural signs from God. You better believe that Moses was expecting lightning to rain from the heavens or something and miraculously destroy the Egyptians. But instead, God tells him, hold your stick out over the water. And the whole nation, three million people, are going to cross through the Red Sea on dry ground. Pretty improbable. That's definitely a say what? So what would it take for him to do the absolutely improbable and in his mind probably very impossible? It took faith. It took incredible faith. Raise your staff out. Stretch your hand over the sea to divide the water. Verse 19, then the angel of God, listen, who had been traveling in front of Israel's army, withdrew and went behind them. Suddenly they're starting to see supernatural stuff happening. The pillar of cloud also moved from in front of them and stood behind them, coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. It says that Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided. And the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a water, wall of water on their right and on their left. Verse 23, the Egyptians pursued them. And all of Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen followed them into the sea. Verse 24, during the last watch of the night, the Lord looked down from the pillar of fire. The Lord looked down from the pillar of fire. God was there all along. He wasn't doing this from some remote location somewhere. God was there. He was right there. He was in the pillar of fire. And he looked down from the pillar of fire at the Egyptian army. Listen to what he did. He threw it into confusion. Isn't this what he just did with the Philistines? Yes. He threw the whole Egyptian army into confusion. Verse 25, he jammed the wheels of their chariots so that they had difficulty driving. And the Egyptians said, let's get away from these Israelites. The Lord is fighting for them against Israel. Church, you need to believe that's what's going to happen every time the enemy comes against you in any way. <laughs> Friends, I want you to think about this. One man, one man, Moses, one man believed that one man obeyed in spite of it being so unlikely, so improbable, and that one man saved a nation of three million people. Friends, the faith and obedience of this one man led to the total destruction of the largest and most powerful army on earth. The faith of one man. Friends, that means that we, you and I, we are to possess and employ faith in far more than just isolated incidents.